Good morning and welcome to educational session dedicated to the draft standard ESRS2 on pollution. In my presentation, I will cover three different areas. In the first one, I will give you an overview of the European Union Legal Acts that represent the framework used in developed draft ESRS2. Then I will introduce the standard to our presentation with a general content, mainly in terms of the objective that define the scope of ESRS E2. Finally, I will go into details regarding the disclosure requirements and the application requirements in which the standard is structured that consists of data points to be disclosed by the undertaking. Let's start with the first item in our agenda, the EU legal framework. The content has been split into two parts. The first item is dedicated to EU sustainable finance legislation. The basis of ESRS is, of course, the CSRD. In the box, I have reported the main extra to the directive, directly related to pollution. Recital 35 provides the standards should in particular be aligned with sustainable finance disclosure regulation and take into account underlying indicators and the methodologies set out in taxonomy regulation and benchmark regulation. This content has been transposed in the new Article 29b.5 of the Accounting Directive. Recital 40 Recital 42 states the importance of the reduction of the level of pollution in order to reach a climate neutral and circular economy. An important provision is set by the new Article 29b-2a that explicitly mentions pollution as a separate environmental matter that shall be covered by the sustainability reporting standards. EFRAG has decided to keep this topic at the sector agnostic level, despite the fact that in public consultation, some respondents claim that pollution should be, should be better addressed at the sector-specific level. The second box reports the main provision of the taxonomy regulation related to pollution prevention and control. Finally, the third box covers a SFDR principle of diverse impacts associated to pollution. As we can explain in detail later, these four indicators have been incorporated into the metric and target section. The following slide reports the EU legal acts as the main framework used to develop the standards. The following slide reports the EU legal acts as the main framework used to develop the standards. The first two legal acts are directly mentioned in CSRT. In particular, EMAS is an important management instrument developed by the European Commission, even for companies to evaluate, report, and improve their environmental performance. These schemes supports organization in finding the right tools to improve their environmental performance and also improve their transparency, providing publicly available information on an organizational or environmental performance. The other acts include pollution as a subject covered by this legislation and have been taken into account in particular in the definition of the disclosure requirements. I'm referring to the REACH regulation, which places responsibility on industry to manage the risk from chemicals and to provide safety information on the substances. And also to the CLP regulation that requires companies to classify, label, and package their substance before placing them on the market. It also aims to protect workers, consumers, and the environment by labeling that reflects a particular chemical's possible hazards. The objective of ESRC2 is to specify the disclosure requirements which will enable users of the sustainability statements to understand these five areas of disclosure. How the undertaking affects pollution of air, water, and soil in terms of material positive and negative actual, actual or potential impacts. The actions to prevent or mitigate these impacts, the change in the strategy and business models in line with the transition to a sustainable economy, the main dimension on the undertaking's material risk and opportunities, and in the end, the financial effects on the undertaking over the short, medium, and long term. 
The architecture of the standard is presented in the next slide. The standard is structured around two sections under which the disclosure requirements are included. The impact, risk and opportunities management section, in short, IRO section, contains the disclosure requirement related to ESRS2 and the two disclosure requirements on policies and actions. Finally, the section on metrics and targets cover the remaining four disclosure requirements. Materiality assessment plays a central law role in the identification and assessment of which sustainability matters are material or not. The sustainability matters addressed by the current standard are air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution, and substances of concern, and substances of very high concern. The objective of IRO 1 in ESRS 2 is to provide, provide an understanding of the process through which the undertaking identifies IRO and assess their materiality. The disclosure requirement in E2 related to ESRS 2 should be reported alongside the disclosures required by ESRS 2. Under this requirement, the undertaking shall describe the process to identify material IRO and shall provide information on methodologies assumptions and tools used to screen its site location and business activities. The interconnection between risk and opportunities rising from impacts and dependencies and the process for conducting consultation, in particular with affected communities. According to the corresponding application requirements, the undertaking shall consider the LEAP approach when contacting and materiality assessment on pollution. The LEAP approach has been proposed by the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures and consists of four phases. In the first phase, the undertaking shall consider location, including site locations of direct assets and operation and activities across the value chain, where emissions of water, soil, and their pollutants occur, sectors or business units related to those emissions. In the second phase, the undertaking shall then consider evaluating impacts and dependencies for each material site or sector business unit. Based on the result of phase one and two, the undertaking shall consider assessing the material risks and opportunities by identifying transition and physical risks and the opportunities related to pollution prevention and control. The outcome of the materiality assessment consists, consists of a list of site locations where pollution is a material issue and a list of business activities associated with the pollution material error. The next slides cover the disclosure requirement related to, pollution, to policies and actions. The next slides cover the disclosure requirements related to policies and actions. According to ESRS 1, a policy implements an undertaking strategy or management decision related to a material sustainability matter. If pollution has been assessed as a material topic, the undertaking shall disclose its policies implemented to manage its material IRO related to pollution prevention and control according to the disclosure requirement E21. It's important to remember that if the topic is material, but the undertaking has not yet implemented the respective policies, action, and target, this fact shall be disclosed and the time frame to implement them might be reported. The key content of information on policies is contained in ESRS2 DCP. In addition, the undertaking shall indicate whether and how its policies address the following areas along the value chain. Mitigating negative impacts related to pollution of air, water, and soil, minimize and substituting substance of concern and phasing out substance of very high concern, and avoiding incidents and emerging situations. A policy is implemented through actions or action plans. Actions are implemented to ensure that the undertaking delivers to meet targets. And they also refer to decisions to support these with financial, humor, human, or technological resources. 
According to the disclosure requirement E22, the key content of information is contained in ESRS2 DCA. In addition, the undertaking shall specify to which layer in the mitigation hierarchy actions and resources can be allocated. The mitigation hierarchy encompasses three, these three layers, avoiding pollution, including any phase out of materials or compounds that have a material negative impact, reducing pollution, including any phase out of materials or compounds, and restoring, regenerating, and transforming ecosystem where pollution has occurred. Application requirement number 13 requires that where actions extend to upstream or downstream value chain engagements, the undertaking shall provide information on this type of engagements. Policies and actions are followed by targets and metrics that combine qualitative and quantitative data points. In particular, disclosure requirement E23 covers the set of information related to targets. Targets refer to measurable outcome-oriented goals that the undertaking aims to achieve in relation to material high load. Indeed, the CSRD requires undertaking to disclose the time-bound targets related to sustainability matters, including a description of the progress the undertaking has made towards achieving these targets. Under this provision, the undertaking shall disclose the pollution-related targets it has adopted presenting the information contained in ESRS2 DCT and shall also indicate whether and how its targets relate to the prevention and control of air pollutants, emission to water, soil pollution, and substances of concern and substances of very high concern. Ecological thresholds have been introduced to comply with the CSRD provisions that require a statement of whether the undertaking targets related to environmental factors are based on conclusive scientific evidence. In case the undertaking sets targets based on the ecological threshold, it shall specify a set of information about the ecological thresholds identified and the methodology used to identify such thresholds, whether or not the thresholds are entity specific and if so, how they were determined, and our responsibility for respecting identified ecological threshold is allocated in the undertaking. The undertaking shall also specify whether the targets that it has adopted and presented are mandatory or voluntary. In that case, the undertaking shall disclose if and how such legal requirements were taken into account when considering ecological thresholds. Disclosure requirement E24 requires the disclosures of metrics in terms of qualitative and quantitative indicators. The undertaking used these metrics to measure and report on progress over time. Metrics under, the, under this disclosure requirement are defined in terms of quantitative of emissions generated in the air, water and soil in the undertaking's own operations. The first box shows the four indicators envisaged by the SFDR that according to ESRS2 are always to be disclosed. The disclosure of such indicators are not subject to the materiality assessment. The quantitative metric on microplastic is an indicator subject to a materiality assessment and it has been included in the list of pollutants due to its high level of potential impact on the environment. The quantitative information is accompanied by contextual information on methodologies and processes to collect data. Under the application requirement number 27, the information is provided at group level. However, the undertaking may elect to disclose additional breakdown including information on site level or a breakdown of its emissions by type of source, by sector, or by geographical area. Another important indicator is the reported in the disclosure requirement E25 that deals with substances of concern and substances of very high concern. 
The definition of these terms is based on, on the REACH regulation and CLP regulation. And the inclusion of data points related to such substances is due to the serious effect they cause on the environment. In general, this kind of information is already stored by the undertaking, even if it may not be aggregated in the way required, required by the disclosure requirement. The objective of this disclosure requirement is to enable an understanding of the impact of the undertaking on health and the environment to substance of concern, a substance of very high concern on their own operation. The data to be disclosed are the total amount of substance of concern and substance of very high concern generated or used during the production or, their, or that are procured and the lead its facilities as emissions, as product, or as a part of products and services. Last but not least is the disclosure requirement E26 regarding the potential financial effect from pollution related to IRO. SRS1 provides the general requirement regarding the material financial information that impact on the undertaking cash flow, financial position, or access to finance, or the short medium and long-term horizons. In particular, the disclosure shall include a quantification of the potential financial effects in monetary terms with the inclusion of the share of net revenue made with products and services that are or that contain substance concern and substance of very high concern. Separately, OPEX and CAPEX associated with the major incidents and deposits the provisions for environmental protection and remediation cost. Where impracticable, the undertaking shall disclose qualitative information. The disclosure also includes a description of the effects considered, the related impacts and the time horizon in which they are likely to materialize, and the critical assumption used in the estimate. Appendix D of ESRS1 defines the list of transitional provision of the disclosure requirement in which the disclosures follow a gradual approach. The undertaking may comply with the ESRS E26, reporting only qualitative disclosure for the first three years of preparation of its sustainability statements. The information on the operating and capital expenditure associated with major incidents and deposits is not subject to the transition provisions. Thank you.